good evening, uh, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, the second in this year's series of public lectures, the Environment and Geography Department's public lectures. Um, and this is uh, coinciding with the University's Warm Planet Week. Thanks very much for coming out tonight. Um, tonight, we're very pleased to welcome Professor Jonathan Brigg. Uh, before I do the introduction, I just want to point out that we are uh, live streaming and recording this event, uh, but uh, rest assured, the camera will not be pointed at you at any time. Um, if anybody, uh, we have a sort of a privacy notice uh, on the door to explain uh, how we're organizing this. But Good, please come on and take a seat. And So uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Jonathan Rigg, Chair in Human Geography at the uh, University of Bristol. Um, Jonathan has uh, a wealth of experience, particularly working in Southeast Asia and looking at rural development and agrarian transitions. Tonight he's going to be talking about uh, climate science and making climate science human. Uh, Jonathan. Oh, which, oh, so, sorry, the plan for this evening is that uh, Jonathan will talk for about 40, 45 minutes, um, and then we're going to open the floor for questions. And I'll be moving around the room with a microphone to facilitate the question and answer session. Okay, over to Jonathan. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Richard. Well, first of all, thank you for coming out. Cold night. Um, I'm <coughs> impressed. When Richard said it was going to be 7.30 to 9, I didn't think anyone would be here, but um, thank you. So wonderful to see you. Um, first of all, this is the first time I've given, this is true, the first time I've given this um, particular presentation. So you're kind of guinea pigs. I've been thinking about these things for quite a while, um, about how a social scientist, which is what I am, would think about climate science. But I've never actually given a presentation. I've written a couple of papers which touch on these issues, but I haven't had an audience such as you. So you're kind of, I suppose, guinea pigs. Um, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully it will hang together. Um, and before I get going, as Richard was sort of hinting, most of my work has been on agrarian change. So I spend most of my time sitting in villages in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, also Sri Lanka, Nepal, trying to work out why farmers do what they do. And I think, as you'll see, that will kind of come through in what I'm arguing in this. Because what will come through, I think, is when you talk to farmers, you realize that although processes of environmental change are central to their lives, they don't necessarily think about it or make decisions based upon how scientists imagine is going on. So I'm kind of trying to bring together, I suppose, ordinary people and everyday life and climate science. And I hope that will come through. <coughs> and I've got, there'll be occasions when it will get slightly academic. Hopefully I won't lose you as a result. Um, normally I'm talking to students and academics rather than members of, I suppose, wider society. But I want to start with kind of three quotes, which I think kind of sit behind I suppose, the concerns that drive this talk. And I'll just read them out, and then there'll be very few quotes after that. We find it deeply paradoxical and disturbing that the growing acknowledgement of the impact of societal forces on the biosphere <coughs> should be couched in terms of a narrative so completely dominated by natural science. The global change research community has been charged with producing a post-political Anthropocene narrative dominated by the natural sciences and focused on environmental rather than social change. <coughs> so both these sets of quotes are kind of looking at a disjuncture, a tension between environmental change and social change, environmental processes and social realities. 
And it's that kind of tension, that intersection, which I'm going to be focusing on. And that leads to what's sometimes termed climate reductionism, which means the reducing of climate change to a very kind of demarcated natural process that we can understand through predictive natural sciences. And that's kind of what I want to explore. And I thought I'd start with this. This is a wonderful painting. I don't know, anyone seen this painting before? Uh, Peter Bruegel, or probably Peter Bruegel, um, end of the 16th century. And as you can see, it's called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. And you kind of look at it and you think, well, we all know the story of Icarus and Daedalus making wings of wax and flying too close to the sun. But I mean, this doesn't seem to be anything to do with them. We've got a plowman with his head down, plowing the land. We've got a shepherd in the middle looking out into the sky, the sheep around him. We've got a ship sailing into the distance. And if you look carefully here, you see Icarus falling into the ocean, just his legs kind of disappearing uh, under the water. Um, and in a way, this sort of sums up what I'm interested in. I mean, essentially, it's, it's kind of saying life goes on. I mean, here's this era-defining moment when Icarus fails and falls into the ocean, but it doesn't, it barely leaves a ripple in anyone else's lives. And I suppose I'm kind of asking, is this sort of climate change here? You know, we're carrying on in our own ways. And maybe, what is the connection between Icarus climate change and the rest of us? So in an odd sort of way, this painting is a nice way into thinking about <coughs> what I want to talk about today. And this is a photo I took a couple of years ago in Laos. And very much like the plowman here. He's got his head down with his rotavator, what used to be known as Thailand as a quai lek, an iron buffalo, and he's plowing the land. And he's, you know, he's focused on plowing his land, and around him things are changing, but they don't necessarily impact the ripple across his life. And Final photo kind of in, in introduction. This was taken by a PhD student of mine, someone called Robert Cole, who was working on hybrid maize production in upland Laos. So he's been living in a province called Hua Pan in upland Laos on the border between Laos and Vietnam. And this land is um, cultivated by Hmong minority hill peoples. And it's been planted to Monsanto hybrid maize, which is then feeding down into the global agro-food system. Essentially, it's ending up in um, animal feed to raise pigs to go into the Chinese kind of pig meat market. Um, and as you can see here, I mean, extraordinary environmental change occurring. Some of it produced by the actions of Hmong formerly shifting cultivators. I mean, they used to grow opium. Now they're growing maize. And some of it linked to climate change. This is a part of the world that is already being affected by extreme weather events, floods, droughts, shorter growing cycles, that sort of thing. So here we, in this picture, it's that intersection of the human decisions of the Hmong shifting cultivators or former shifting cultivators and environmental change. And I think there are kind of four areas of reductionism that I want to talk about, um, focus on. One is disciplinary, well you can see them here, disciplinary, participatory, experiential, and species. And I think between them, I'd like to think they highlight a particular problem with climate science. So, start with the first, disciplinary reductionism. By which I mean, kind of what lens academic lens do we see the world and interpret the world around us. Um, I'm a geographer. I did my first degree, in fact, in geography and art and archaeology at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. <coughs> then I taught geography in Durham. Then I went out to the National University of Singapore. And now I'm at Bristol. 
but I've always kind of been in a geography department. So my disciplinary home is geography. And everyone in this university, or most 90% of people in this university, will have a disciplinary home. If you stop them in the street, they would say, yes, I'm a physicist. Although Richard is one who he probably wouldn't be able to say what he is. But, oh, I'm a physicist, I'm a chemist, I'm a biologist, whatever it is. So we all have a particular kind of way in academic, we've been trained in a particular way. And normally when I sit down with my PhD students and I'm encouraging them to think through what they're going to do, this is the sort of thing that I'm kind of pushing them. I'm sort of saying, what is, what's the theoretical lens that you're using to understand what it is you're studying? How do you frame that issue? What are your aims and objectives? What are your research questions? What are the hypotheses that drive your idea? Yeah? So I'm endlessly narrowing, trying to squeeze them into a box. And by doing that, of course, we all kind of play the game of our discipline. There's an axiom, um, I don't know who said it first, that you know, the world has problems, universities have departments. Yeah? And there are problems out there like climate change, like migration, like the war on terror. And the question is, how do they sit within a disciplinary framework? How do they sit? I mean, how would a geographer look at climate change? How would an environmental scientist? And we're all kind of involved in this. And of course, by doing this, we, we play the game of the discipline that we're involved with. We tick the boxes. We do what's expected of us. So I'll tell a story now about how that actually, what that does in, what effects it has. In 2005, following the Indian Ocean tsunami, you know, when about, around about 225,000 people died. So there's the earthquake off Sumatra, the tsunami, particularly affected Aceh in northern Sumatra, but also reached Sri Lanka, parts of India, in fact, all the way across to the coast of Africa. And close to a quarter of a million people died. And we were given money by the National Science Foundation in the US to study how people responded to the tsunami. So quite soon after the event, we were in Thailand and Malaysia looking at um, what happened. And this is a photo taken in Malaysia. We were in a minibus. And we were, we were an interdisciplinary team, or multidisciplinary team. So in our team, we had geographers like myself, we had historians, uh, we had um, people who worked on storm surges, physical geographers, earth scientists. Yeah, we were a mixed bunch. We got out of a minibus when we arrived at this particular location. All the natural scientists went down to the beach to find, to gather physical evidence for the event. They were, went down with their kind of spatulas to gather the sand. They were looking about how, they were wondering whether, if they, they could look at sand on a microscope and work out the power of the wave and maybe work out where it had come from. They were looking for physical evidence. The social scientists, so May Tan Mullins there in the middle in the pink shirt, went to talk to people. And it was just a natural process. Half of the group went to talk to the fishermen to say, where were you? Did you see the wave? How high was it? How many were there? Where did it come from? And the natural scientists went down to the beach to gather physical evidence from which they could answer those questions. And that reflected our traditions, the way that we were trained, what we count as evidence. So for them, talking to some <coughs> random fisherman or fisherwoman didn't count as evidence, but something collected from the coastline would. So it kind of struck us at the time when we were talking about it that what we did spontaneously, without even thinking about it, reflected this, our training in particular fields of study. So Deepesh Chakrabarti, who's a historian at the University of Chicago, says this, the crisis of climate change calls on academics to rise above their disciplinary prejudices for it is a crisis of many dimensions. So he's saying, as a historian, that we need to stop responding in that sort of intuitive elemental way. We need to begin to think differently 
and almost get out of our comfort zone, so to speak. Right, so how might that happen? Um, we have, I've been thinking of myself, um, in terms of my discipline, I'm a geographer, so that's where I sit. Um, there's a claim that we need to do more multidisciplinary research on things like climate change. Climate change requires the bringing together of different disciplines. So you might have a historian like Deepesh Chakrabarti, you might have a sociologist or whatever. Yeah, so that's multidisciplinarity. But in a way, if we really want to tackle these things, we need to go beyond multidisciplinarity. We have to go to what's known as interdisciplinarity, which is where these things don't sit separately, but you actually bring them together. And now you might think, well, what's the difference? This project, I'm going to go back to it, it was billed as an interdisciplinary project funded by the National Science Foundation, but being I think it was really multidisciplinary, it wasn't interdisciplinary, in that we all stayed resolutely in our disciplinary boxes, and we didn't actually work together. So we all then wrote papers, you know, the earth scientists in earth science journals, and the geographers in geography journals, and the historians in history journals. We didn't actually work together, and that's what's required with interdisciplinarity. So that's hard to do. I mean, as they say, you know, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Now, people keep banging on about the need to do interdisciplinarity, but actually doing it requires an awful lot of hard work. And then there's transdisciplinarity, which is how to bring that into policy. So academics, um, I mean, those of you in here who are not academics, we're now increasingly required to show that our research has impact by which is meant social impact. So sadly, we can't, we're not meant to sit in our ivory towers and write papers that no one reads. We have to demonstrate that what we do is use, useful for wider society. And universities now get ranked and rewarded for doing that. So significant sums of money come to universities that can demonstrate social impact, particularly through getting science into policy. But there's one other challenge. When we talk about interdisciplinarity, I think there are, well, I've got two terms here, shallow interdisciplinarity. That's kind of disciplinarity between allied fields. So Richard and I, I'm a, I'm a geographer, he trained as an anthropologist. But we can sit down together and we kind of know what, we, we have the same language, I think. Fair? Yes. We can, talk, we can work together, we, we can be on projects together. I get him. But if he was a geologist, there'd be a little bit more, a bit more of a challenge. So often when people do interdisciplinarity, they do this sort of shallow interdisciplinarity, disciplinarity between allied disciplines. These are all predictive natural sciences. This is deep interdisciplinarity. When you're melding together the in predictive natural sciences and the interpretive social sciences. It's a completely different way of thinking about problem solving and problem identification. And this is very rare. So when kind of people say, oh yeah, we've got an interdis interdisciplinary project, I often wonder which one is it? Is it this one or is it shallow? And often it's shallow interdisciplinarity. Right, so give you another example of how that sort of works. Um, I've been working with um, two colleagues, one in Melbourne University, one at Ottawa, um, Melissa Marshak and Vanessa Lamb, and we've been looking at mangroves and mangrove communities in Cambodia. So there they are, this is off Got Kong. And I've also been working on reclaimed land in Singapore. So these are two completely different environments. I mean, both, in both cases, we're interested kind of in how people live. But on the face of it, you wouldn't have thought there'd be a connection. But there is. There's a close connection between what happens in our mangrove sites and our mangrove communities 
and what happens in Singapore. And that's because of sand mining. So millions, tens of millions of tons of sand are mined, extracted river, riverine and marine sands from protected areas in Cambodia, and it ends up in Singapore. Singapore's land area is around about 25% larger today than it was in 1965, when Singapore gained full self-government. That sand used to come from Malaysia, then from Indonesia, then from the Philippines, all those three countries banned the mining of sand, and the majority now comes from Cambodia. And it's shipped from, so that village, Got Kong, is around here, shipped from there to Singapore. A lot of it illegally, so it's illegally mined. Um, and it kind of makes you think, right, well, how do we understand that? How do we think about this trade in sand? How do we think, as scholars, about the links between fishing communities in Cambodia and, if you like, multinational banks in Singapore? How do we make that connection? And it comes back to the, the bit, slide I had earlier, with the kind of um, diagonal line. How do we frame it? How do we theorize it? How do we kind of think it through? And there are kind of two ways you can do it. You can do it vertically. vertically. So here we have, this is sand. Sand is mined. It gets given value through its mining. It's then traded up to Singapore, and it's used for land reclamation, for expanding the land area of Singapore. In that way, a worthless commodity, sand, gets given value, and it gets given, given value through a kind of global production network perspective. The other way we can think about it is more horizontal. We can ask, well, how does sand in the communities in Cambodia, what's its role in sustaining livelihoods, semi-subsistence livelihoods? These are livelihoods that are not captured by standard economics because people catch fish and they eat them. Some goes into the market, but a lot of it doesn't. Yeah, so it doesn't appear in national statistics. But if you remove the sand, you destroy the fishing industry. Fish can no longer breed, it increases turbidity, and you lose catch. And in fact, in this village, this is an abandoned house here. Round about a large slice of the population can no longer make a living because of sand mining. And they end up having to leave, well, they get marginalized by the process, and some of them then end up as labor migrants working on the construction sites in Singapore, where they're using the sand mined from their own villages in order to kind of build, sustain, and expand the economy of Singapore. So these are two very different ways of thinking about the same intersection of processes. One's kind of vertical, the other's horizontal. And it means that the framing of the problem results in a different, if you like, set of answers. So in that sense, methodology is kind of not innocent. It's not just something you take off the shelf and choose. It has a really significant effect on the answers you end up with. And I think sometimes we don't fully appreciate that. So in a way, what I'm saying is that, I mean, Singapore has a higher per capita income than the UK. It's one of the wealthiest countries in the world now. I mean, it was, of course, an erstwhile colony of the UK. 1965, it gained um, full independence. It was claimed by Sir Stanford Raffles in 1819. So it celebrated, if you like, its 200th anniversary um, as an island state last year. But its prosperity is intimately linked to the precarious lives of those villagers in Cambodia. But you, in a sense, we wouldn't really have identified it if we take a global production network approach. It was only through tracking livelihoods horizontally that it became clear how this 
and this are, as I say, intimately tied together. Okay, so that's the first reductionism, which is disciplinary. Yeah, we have a lot to answer for, in a sense, as academics working in disciplines, because, as I said, the world has problems, universities have departments, and maybe departments aren't the best places to investigate things like climate change. Second reductionism I call participatory. And by that, I suppose I'm sort of focusing on this question of who do we, who do we listen to when it comes to thinking about climate change? Whose voices count? I mean, I came up on the train this morning. I came with my bicycle, and then I bicycled from the train station here, and I tried to go along the river, and as I'm sure all of you know, I couldn't because it was closed, you know? And they interview people on the television who are, you know, cross with the fact that this hasn't happened or that hasn't happened. But I mean, who do you talk to about flooding? Whose voices count? Who are the experts, yeah? Do you feel marginalized? I mean, you have to live with this, presumably a lot of you live in New York, yeah? Does your voice count? And so that's the kind of question I'm asking. And some of you may be wondering just that thing with respect to the floods at the moment. So um, it's not just the intellectual framework that we take. So it's not just that I'm a geographer and Richard's a development studies a specialist and someone else is a sociologist. It's also the question of who do we talk to? Now, who do we, whose voices, whose evidence count in the sense of being taken seriously? So this is a picture taken gosh, quite a long time ago now, maybe 10 or 15 years. This is interviewing a farmer in, in Laos. So we're trying to find out about how he lives his life, how he gets by, and that sort of thing. So I suppose there I am, I suppose, trying to take his views seriously. I see him as, if anything, a more significant person to talk to than an official or an expert. He has more to tell me about what it's like to be a farmer and the challenges he faces than some government official in the Lao People's Democratic Republic. But of course, and I suppose you could say this is participation. This is me trying to be participatory in gathering evidence. But of course, there's a whole range of levels of participation from at the top nominal. I mean, you may sometimes feel that. People come and talk to you and you think they're not really interested in what I'm saying. They're just ticking a box here. You know, that's nominal participation, through to truly transformative, where they listen to you, and actually it has an effect. You know, they're seriously taking your views on board with a view to transforming policy, practice, whatever it happens to be. And there are a whole range of kind of levels between the nominal, the box ticking, and the transformative. <coughs> Just um, last week, I reviewed a paper for an academic journal. I mean, most reviews are double blind, so the author of the paper doesn't know who I am as a reviewer, and I don't know who they are. But anyway, in this paper, it says, the average Thai farmer living on three to five dollars a day lacks scientific awareness. Yep. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not worth asking. It's quite, it's bedded quite deeply in among I think experts, and I mean academics particularly, the sense that we know and they don't. So a man like this, who I first interviewed in 1982, I took this photo in 2008, so I've kind of seen him grow up. He's done amazing stuff, he's traveled around the world as a, as a laborer, and here he is when I last saw him. Um, you know, he's incredibly aware. He has a passport, he's traveled, he's been to the Middle East, he understands a great deal. So when I read things like that in paper, I think, no, that's so profoundly wrong. But it's very easy to do when you're a scholar, a decision maker, an expert. And of course, it kind of matters at a more practical level. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, this is a very famous avenue of resin trees between two towns in northern Thailand. 
And uh, a few years ago, there was a rumor that they were all going to be chopped down, that the army were in league with dark influences, and they were going to, under a pretext of widening the road, they were going to chop them all down, and they're going to make a killing selling this very rare, valuable wood. And non-governmental organizations and activists thought, right, what can we do? We can't challenge the state, and the army has power. This was at a time when there was a military dictatorship in Thailand. So what they did is they ordained all the trees. This is known as Boat Ba. They made them monks. They ordained them as monks. And then, of course, no one would cut them down. I mean, of course, in Buddhist theology, you can't ordain a tree. A tree can't be a monk. Only humans can become monks. Trees can't. But nonetheless, this is what made the difference. So in a way, this shows, if you like, the power of participation to change things. Now, however many experts came in here and tried to work out how do you stop people chopping down the trees, it was the simplicity of getting young monks to ordain trees which changed things. I mean, I'm not suggesting that um, participation <coughs> is the answer to all of the problems of climate change. I mean, of course not. I mean, this is um, an attempt that we had to produce um, a map of forest use in Laos using participatory mapping. And if you look at the photo, you can probably notice they're all men. That wasn't what we wanted. We wanted a mix of men and women. The women were just squeezed out. The men said, yo, yo, this is, this is for us. And they all sat down and started mapping. So you can get what are known as participatory exclusions. And you also get what's known as elite capture. So the way that certain subsections of society tend to be much better at this sort of thing than others. Generally, the better educated, the middle classes, the ones with time. I mean, often the poorest people in the villages that we work in simply don't have the time for this sort of thing. They've got better things to do than draw maps. So it ends up with, it masquerades participation. But I think we've always kind of got to be skeptical about that. Nonetheless, I think there are three reasons why drawing people into the debate, I mean, you know, people like all of us and more, people who aren't in this room, of course, and who would never be in this room, are equally important. Um, I think for scientific reasons, a man like this knows these things. I mean, although he may only earn three to four dollars a day, he probably has more accumulated knowledge than most of the specialists in the field. So I think there are good scientific reasons why we should talk to more people. I think there are pragmatic reasons, a little bit like the word bar, because it will mean that policies have traction. They'll have an effect. They'll make a difference. If you just design policies without participation, they're less likely to kind of adhere in policy terms. And finally, kind of for normative reasons. Well, of course, because we should. I mean, whether it makes any difference, surely we should talk to people. So there are kind of three sets of reasons why drawing, if you like, casting our net much wider than hitherto we've done is important. <clears throat> right. Experiential reductionism. So this is my third one. I've got four, so there's two more to go. And this one is that essentially climate change is not the only show in town. And for this, I'll give you an example from Nepal. So about for the last 10 years or so, I've been working on earthquakes and earthquakes and resilience and secondary hazards in Nepal and in the Himalayan Massif. So following that work on the tsunami, after the Indian Ocean tsunami, I was kind of drawn into work on earthquakes. And I had a PhD student, I'll show you a picture of her in a moment, called Katie Oven, who um, did her PhD on landslides, which are secondary hazards. So often what kills people in earthquakes, not the earthquakes, but the landslides that follow. Yeah, all their houses collapse. Um, this is a picture of, I mean, a graph of Nepal, 
number of fatalities, so the number of people killed in landslides. And the argument made by natural scientists is that over time, this is increasing. And this is linked to climate change. Extreme weather events, more concentrated rainfall, and therefore more landslides. And the argument is that as climate change and extreme weather events become more common, we will see more and more fatalities from landslides. So for natural scientists, I'm not disputing this, there is a link between climate change, landslides, and fatalities from landslides. There's Katie. Um, and she studied landslides. <clears throat> what is happening in Nepal is people are moving from off-road locations, so they're living in the countryside away from the road, they're moving from off-road locations to the roadside. And they're doing it for fairly obvious reasons. It gives them access to markets, better access to schools, healthcare, they can sell surpluses, they're more connected. But in moving to roadsides, they become exposed to landslides. Most landslides occur where a road is cut through the mountainside. So they're moving from places where they're comparatively safe, off-road communities and locations, to areas where they're exposed to danger. And her PhD was to explore that process, to try and understand people's awareness of landslides, you know, what they were doing about it, how to minimize the effects, reduce vulnerability and exposure, and so forth. And so what she did is she started by doing participatory risk mapping. She would sit down with groups of people and talk to them about the risks that they faced. And she went in with the assumption that landslides would be at the top and earthquakes at the top of their list of concerns. And these are the kind of hierarchies that she got. Earthquakes barely figured. Landslides were there. The things that they were really concerned about were traditional stoves, the impact of large hydropower projects, lack of health services, low levels of literacy. And these things weren't on her, her checklist. I always remember when she, um, she sent me an email. Jonathan, I don't know what to do. I've come in here thinking that landslides are the problem. And they've told me they're not a problem. They're not really worried about landslides. Landslides are not, they're worried about how do they get their children to school? How do they sell a surplus? How do they deal with traditional stoves? So she went in with a very kind of fixed idea of what the problem was. And after a few months of being in the field, living in this village, recognizing that actually it was way down their list of priorities. And in her PhD, she says this, for the majority of householders in this study, landslide risk was a low priority concern and immediate more tangible needs were seen to dictate perception of risk. Put simply, and of course there are a number of different experiences, in the off-road settlements, households were more concerned with meeting their subsistence needs, while at the roadside with these needs met, Householders aspire to build bigger houses, to expand their business, and to generally enhance their well-being. Local people do not prioritize landslides. And it's a bit like that with climate change. Yeah? Because landslides and climate change are tied together. So we start with climate change. We think it's the only show in town, which is what she was thinking initially. And then we find out that, hey, hang on, actually, that's not what dominates people's mindsets. And um, I mean, what you need to remember, this is, I was talking about this, in fact, this book earlier today. This is a lovely book on China. And there's a set part of the book when um, Tawny says, there are districts in China in which the position of the rural population is that of a man standing permanently up to his neck in water so that even a ripple is sufficient to drown them. And it's a little bit, maybe not quite that dire, in Nepal. You know, landslides really come way down the list when you're in a situation like that. <clears throat> so, to 
kind of bring that to some of the work that I do. Um, this is a village near the Mekong that I've been working in for three or four years. And um, these are rubber trees. So this is land that was formerly cropped, planted to rice, is now planted to rubber, um, which is a real surprise. I mean, I mean, if someone had said to me 10 or 15 years ago that people would be changing rubber land to rubber, um, rice land to rubber, I kind of said, no, I just cannot believe that that would ever happen. And um, so the question is kind of what's going on? How do we explain this kind of paradoxical counterintuitive shift from high value, um, existentially important rice to rubber, which takes 10 or 15 years to mature? You know, what's going on here? Um, some people see this tied to climate change. So they would say, well, what we see here is climate change is altering the nature of rainfall. It's making this land less suitable for rice cultivation. It's had negative impacts on agricultural output. And there's a process of adaptation. And the planting of rubber is the adaptation to climate change. So you put climate change at the beginning and at the center of your explanatory fabric. Yeah. And therefore, adaptations like this are then tied back to climate change. Another possibility is that, and you would explore this differently, you would say, well, hang on. We need to understand where does rubber and rice sit within livelihoods? What's the place of agriculture in the context of households who own this land? What are the adaptations to the farming systems? And within that, what's the place of climate change? So we then ask the question, how does, is there any role for climate change in this transformation? Or is it actually linked to something else? I mean, I would argue the re reason why that's planted to rubber is nothing to do with climate change. It's because of labor shortages. Young people are spending longer in school. They're going to Bangkok. They're excluding themselves from agriculture. Aging householders no longer have the labor to farm rice, which is labor intensive. They're receiving remittances from their children, which keeps them alive. They can buy food. And so they're planting it to rubber. So we can see this either as driven by climate change, which is kind of the easy answer, or we can see it as a rather more complicated process of adaptation in the face of a whole series of economic and social changes. <coughs> right, my final reductionism, species reductionism. And this is kind of about the Anthropocene <coughs> and climate justice. Um, some scholars would say that I mean, this is how we have tended to see ourselves at the top of the pile that, and it's, in a sense it's reflected in the term the Anthropocene it's about us as a species I mean the reason why we're worried about climate change is because of us. What's going to happen to us? And of course, other people would say, well, why are we, I mean, except for the obvious point that we can, we can do it, why are we privileging humans in the context of climate change? What if we place ourselves within a less hierarchical system? So there's a kind of species element to this. But I'm kind of more interested in the climate justice element um, Deepesh Chakrabarti, who I mentioned earlier, he's a wonderful historian. Um, and about six or seven years ago, he started to get interested in climate change, actually longer than that, 10, 11 years ago, in climate change. And he's written some really influential papers as a historian on climate change. And in one of them, he says this, unlike in the crises of capitalism, there are no lifeboats here for the rich and the privileged. And he's so wrong. Yeah. The idea, he was trying to say, we're all in this together. I mean, if I, we were sitting in a room with Bangladeshis and Vietnamese and people from Ghana, you'd say, well, actually, it makes no difference. And of course, it does. I mean, he, the, the fact that he can think that somehow climate change is clearly a global process, but it does not come to rest 
in a kind of equal and undifferentiated way. And all you have to do is look at maps of vulnerability to climate change and look at the places that are vulnerable and all of those shaded red. Bangladesh, Philippines, Sierra Leone, and so on. They're all countries of the global south. You know, the exposed, the poor world, the post-colonial world, whatever you want to call it. It's not us that's most vulnerable. So, if we look at the global distribution of per capita emissions of CO2, there it is. The red are the countries, unsurprisingly, that are producing most of the CO2. And if this was historic, of course, it would be even worse. So this is current, not historic. It's not cumulative over history. And that's global distribution of vulnerability. And they're almost inverted. Yeah? So you know, the reason why it's so important to see climate change as a global process that has a very particular local signature. Yeah, and who, in a sense, who generates climate change and who suffers from it, they do not map onto each other. And it partly explains maybe why Australia and the US, I mean, I think, wasn't it, Boris Johnson was said he doesn't get it, but maybe it's the same, you know, the countries that don't get it are the ones that, in a sense, owe the most but will suffer the least. And that's why, you know, when Chakrabarti said that, that, you know, there are no lifeboats, that there are lifeboats for us. I mean, I work in Vietnam. There are parts of Vietnam which are already suffering. I mean, they, simp I mean, they do not have the wherewithal to handle it. I mean, notwithstanding the floods here in York, I mean, that's kind of small. I mean, obviously, the, for those who are affected, it's really serious. But compared with what's happening in other places, it's doesn't even begin to compare. OK, so I just rounded off. Um, <coughs> what am I, um, what am I arguing, what I'm not arguing? Well, I'll put here, what, I'm at, what I am and I'm not suggesting. I am saying that um, I'm kind of wondering whose views do we count and who's omitted, you know, whose voices are heard, <coughs> and how do we value and kind of cherish those voices. And it, it's hard work to get alternative, you know, if you like, to democratize climate science because it's such a specialist area of work. Secondly, and kind of slightly more academically, what boundaries do we put around our objects of study? So you think back to the picture I showed of us getting out of that minibus after the tsunami in the Indian Ocean. And in our heads, we had boundaries. The natural scientists had a certain type of evidence they were trying to connect. We had a certain type of evidence that we were trying to collect. We valued different things in different ways. We were kind of, without even really thinking it through, we were creating certain object boundaries, which was then driving our work, our research, in particular ways. <clears throat> um, and I think we've kind of never, we mustn't forget the fact that, I mean, I'm not saying that we owe the world, you know, some, um, maybe I am, but that we've got to recognize the inequalities that sit within the climate change style. This sort of point that it, it is a global process, it's going to affect us all, but we all have different abilities to confront, contest, and ameliorate its effects. What I'm not saying is that climate change is not a problem. Yeah, I'm not suggesting for one moment that it isn't real and that we have to deal with it. I'm kind of saying that climate science, as an academic enterprise, is narrowly framed and there's a need to sort of open up that black box and let more people in. Thank you. Great note to end on. Try and open the black box and uh, let some people in with some questions and uh, uh, Jonathan can respond to. Thanks for blowing my cover, by the way.
Oh, what did I say? This is an anthropologist in development. Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, who would like to go first? We've got a few questions. So maybe we'll take two or three together and then uh, have another round. So there's a question at the back. Is that right? Or is that the no, this, any sudden movement can... <laughs> okay, so we'll take one at the front and then... Uh, <clears throat> Jeff Beacon from the Pollution Tax Association. Um, whose voices are heard? Um, I think we ought to listen to people that know stuff. And my experience is that most academics don't. Uh, Greta Thunberg does far better than most academics, and it's right that we should listen to her. She actually does the science which I think I know where she mostly gets it from, and, and the impacts it has as well. Um, and there were no town planners in, on your bus, were there? We've got to find new ways to live. Nobody's looking. Um, in short, you can have cars to drive or a planet to live in, and nobody's really addressing that. Why don't you, do you want to take that one first, yep, yep. Um, and then we'll do another round? I agree. Um, I, mean, I, I know you said academics don't know anything. I mean, I'm kind Not of with nothing, you. But... I'm kind of with you 60% of the time. I mean, I think the thing is they know an enormous amount and almost too much because it's narrow. And I mean, that, that, I, mean I said it twice already, but I said it for the third time, that kind of axiom that, you know, the world has problems, university has departments. I mean, even in, I mean, I'm a geographer. Geography is meant to be a kind of interdisciplinary subject. But we're slicing up the cake so narrowly now. Because if you're a physical geographer, you know, the kit is so complicated that you end up being narrow, 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 narrow. And, and that means you see a very small kind of part of the problem. And it's why <clears throat> when you go to people like my farmer in there, yeah, he doesn't know what geography is. I mean, he doesn't, he's not disciplinary, Mike. He just... You know, he's lived with the issue, the problem, the challenge of growing rice in a marginal rain-fed environment. He knows every facet of it. And he doesn't begin by saying, OK, now what's my conceptual framework here? What's my theory that's driving this? What are my research questions? Yeah? It's a sort of much more intuitive approach. And I think we have to, even though it doesn't fit necessarily our neat boxes, listening to him opens up a whole kind of vista of understanding which otherwise gets sort of shielded out. So I'm kind of with you. It's not that I think academics I don't, know, don't know anything. I think they kind of know too much and it's too narrow, um, which is why occasionally when you do have academics together, having someone who's a non-academic to ask those difficult questions, to sort of say, well, hang on, are you saying, you seem to be saying the same thing, but you're just using different words. Yeah, so which we all have our own terminology. Which and so academics forth. know what the remaining of Which academics know what the remaining personal carbon budget is to keep within one point five degrees? I mean that's quite an important number. And that Tim Jackson's had a go. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard to actually do do the sums, but I don't know of any academic that knows that and knows how big the task is to stop the six maths extinction and that awful an awful lot of things we do just don't fit in. Maybe we'll come back to this. I think you know, you've opened up a, a much bigger debate and I think a lot of people will want to contribute to. Uh, we have a couple at the back. Um, I have to move around, don't speak to you get the mic please. Hi, um, I'm an undergrad natural scientist here at York, um, and I have the potential to go into climate modelling, and so I suppose that's quite a technical area, and I'm wondering how you think people, scientists that are in more technical areas of climate change can allow this kind of view to come into their work, because I'm going into that kind of thing because I have a climate justice perspective, but my skills are technical, but how can I allow myself to... I like your view, basically. <laughs> um, how do you think I could fit it into my kind of work, in a selfish way, maybe? Should I answer? Um, I'm applying to Bristol as well. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the fact you're asking the question shows that you've gone quite a long way 
towards recognizing that you shouldn't end up narrow, like the first yeah, question. Um, I, and I think, I suppose it means, well, I'm going to fall into kind of platitudes. Of course, it's being open minded, reading widely, you know, um, not burying your head sort of down in your particular area. Um, I mean, if you look at, you know, engineers without frontiers and things like that, sort of, so engineers going out and sort of, as engineers and actually seeing, right, what's the effect of my engineering solutions? You know, do they work, don't they? And if they don't, why don't they? And I suppose doing that sort of thing, but from your own particular area, would then, I mean, in a sense, I mean, to paraphrase the title, keep you human. And I mean, I think in a way, dare I say it, keeping your feet dirty rather than just sitting in the lab really helps going out and I mean I'm a great believer in field work I used to I don't now because of climate change I used to take students and put them into villages in Thailand where they would live with families for two weeks and I'd give them a task and it was just extraordinary to see the transformation in how they thought about things so going from that kind of rather dry academic a little bit like this presentation probably and then actually saying right now I get it I see why this works and why it doesn't and how it fits. So, I mean, I think doing that would also be enormously useful. But, I mean, by the sound of it, being here and asking that question means that I'd be hopeful. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Could you pass the mic uh, behind you, please? Um, it, it seems like uh, an implication of what you're saying is there's a need to kind of decenter climate science in, in inquiry. And you know, you, you've, you've talked really interestingly about this sort of micropolitics of interdisciplinarity at that, that sort of level. Um, but in a sense, at the global level, there's this other politics of knowledge going on of well-funded climate, denial, climate change denialism mm -hmm. and an, an attempts, very well-funded attempts to undermine climate science. So I wonder, you know, in a sense, there's these different kinds of politics of knowledge going on at the global level and then to really answer the questions at the, the local level. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on, because in a sense, the, 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 um, the instinct is, well, we need to defend climate science because it's under attack. But, but then at the, in the inquiry you're looking at, that is not what's needed. So I just yeah. wondered what your thoughts are about the interplay of those things. Yeah, I, um, I kind of wanted to make it clear at the end. I didn't want anyone to go away thinking that somehow I thought climate science was somehow, you know, wrong or, no, you know, I, so... I didn't get that impression. I, yeah, good, good. I, that was... But that was, it should be decentered. Uh, yeah, in, but in rather climate. that... Um, I mean, I think... I mean, of course, I work in an academic context with a lot of people who write for the IPCC reports and that sort of thing. And, of course, among the community that I engage with, I mean, there are almost no deniers. I mean, there are people who say, well, is it this or is it that? But, I mean, the core argument that, you know, there's anthropogenic climate change is not disputed. I realise that the politics kind of high-level politics, you know, the Australian Prime Minister and all the rest of it who's trying to muddy the waters a bit, and I've realised that there are well-funded institutes, and some of the money, as one understands, coming from, you know, the oil industry, oil and gas industry, and so forth. I mean, I realise that they... But I, I sort of feel that each year they're losing their ability to shape the argument. I mean, maybe I'm being over-optimistic there. Um, so... I think there are kind of fewer and fewer people out there like that. Um, and I mean, with one or two, of course, notable exceptions, I think most people are on board. The, the challenge, of course, I mean, it comes back, you know, yeah. I should think everyone in this room, and certainly me, we're probably exceeding our carbon budget, you know, if we want to keep below 1.5, you know, degrees. I mean, How much it, by? Well, probably by, I mean, I don't want, but you know, we're, you know, academics continue to fly everywhere. I went to review a, a new master's program at a university, and they had a compulsory overseas field course. And the, climate, the master's program is on environment and development. And I kind of said, should you really be doing that? Should you be, I mean, not just encouraging, but forcing students to go to Chile? I mean, you think, hang on. So, I mean, we, and, uh, you know, I mean, the number of conferences that get organized that we all fly to and that sort of thing. So there's an interest, there's a kind of mismatch between what we say, this kind of stuff, and actually how we behave and what we do and the decisions we make. So, I mean, uh, there's a huge gap. And I don't think we as academics, uh, you know, we've, we've got an awful long way to go. Um, and um, 
So, but I mean, your point about decentering it, yes. And I mean, I think we have to be kind of more mm. humble and that's open to thinking about climate change within, um, I mean, I suppose the point I was trying to make is that we need to stop seeing it as a kind of, a, you know, something where natural scientists particularly kind of dominate the debate. We need to bring in people like Deepesh Chakrabarti, historians and anthropologists, and there's some really interesting work now done by anthropologists, sociologists, you know, on climate change. And it's kind of beginning to answer the, the why questions, because we kind of know what is happening, but sometimes we don't know why people aren't responding in the way, you know, why aren't they doing what makes sense? And I think to answer those questions, we need the interpretive social sciences, not the predictive natural sciences. So I think that's kind of where it comes in, and it's beginning to change. Um, but still, the huge amount, most of the money most of the leads on the big interdisciplinary projects, they're almost invariably natural scientists. So they're still kind of in control, I would say. Okay, uh, we seem to have a fire service to this side of the room. Is there anyone? Come on over this side. Oh. Anybody else? Yes. Hi there. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in archaeology, so I spend a lot of my time thinking about how we can learn from the past and what the past can teach us in the present um, from your field work and the things that you've, you've been out and seen. Is there, is there any way that we could be learning from the societies that you study about ways to live more sustainable lives or uh, renegotiate our relationship with the environment, which in our sort of capitalist society we seem to become very, very divorced from? Um, just to pick up, I suppose, on some of the things you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, the short answer would be yes, but uh, we want more than that. Um, I mean, when I, a long time ago, did my PhD in 1980, I lived in two villages in northeast Thailand, and I was trying to understand the rice variety selection strategy. So, what rice is farmers grew on particular paddy fields, often half the size of this room. And they had an incredibly complex way, they had traditional varieties of rice. There are about 120,000 different varieties of rice in the world, and they were planting different rice varieties in different agroecological niches. They were juggling risk and reward, all so that they could feed their families in the following year. You know, there were so many subsistence rice cultivators. And I came away kind of bowled over by the sophistication of how they just got by. I mean, they were, they were growing glutinous rain-fed rice. It, wasn't, it was wet rice, but it wasn't irrigated. And it's an area of northeast Thailand that has a very long dry season, there are floods, there are droughts, and they were trying to live with, of course, an ineffectual state, no social security, no bank account, no savings, you know, so there's nothing they could fall back on. And, and I came out and my thesis was essentially about that. Um, and boy, you could learn from that sort of sophisticated approach to dealing with risk. But I then went back to the village a few years later, and every single farmer had given up planting traditional varieties of rice. They're all planting modern hybrid varieties. And um, I mean, that, I kind of thought, wow, that was a waste of my time. <laughs> Here I have written 300 pages on you know, indigenous technical knowledge and all that kind of stuff. And then I go back a handful of years later, and it's all history. Um, so I. So that was a really, um, kind of pulled me up short. And it realized, uh, I suppose it made me realize how difficult it is to see what's just over the event horizon. You never know what's coming. And I mean, the changes in that village, I would never have predicted what happened. I mean, not just with rice, but with lots of other stuff as well. Um, so I think we kind of, um, I mean, it comes back to the question here. I mean, as scholars, scholars, we have to be really modest about our ability to understand what's going on. And I think also, We've got to be careful not to kind of romanticize that sort of thing. Um, and I think I imbued it with almost too much value. Because when I asked them, I said, but, because I had all my stuff in there, I said, look, you told me, you know, <laughs> you told me this and then you told me that. And they said, yeah, I know, but this rice is better. Go, you know, what, what, you know. So it really, as I say, pulled me up short. So yes, I do agree. Um, and there are some amazing sort of sources of knowledge and experience that we can draw on. But I think at the same time, we can't assume that all of that is somehow going to solve the problems that we face now. And things happen in really surprising ways. Okay, uh, 
Uh, I know there's a question over here, but we're going to work around this way. Um, I was just wondering whether the way you framed your overall argument, mm -hmm. perhaps rather than making it into a social scientist, natural scientist debate in, mm -hmm. a, in a way, um, perhaps this is a bit too big perhaps, but perhaps change academia in the sense that how degrees are being taught and introducing more interdisciplinary courses. For example, I studied environmental sciences and I, I was given a lot of choice in, my, in picking modules and I chose many different ones, both social science ones and uh, physical science ones and it gave me a much better understanding of how everything is linked together. So perhaps by changing academia and bringing you know, academics closer to social sciences and social scientists closer to the natural sciences, there might be a better, yeah. you know, hearing mm -hmm. or acceptance of climate change and um, debate. Yeah, no, I mean, completely with you on that. I mean, I think we've got a, I used to occasionally teach at um, Yale and US and they taught a liberal arts degree. And it was a requirement that everyone did natural science, social science, and they didn't have departments like York has here and we have in Bristol and everywhere else. Yeah, so you had you were required to do history and philosophy, and you know all that you'll be taught by all those people. And sometimes the actual courses had no disciplinary kind of monikers in those; you didn't know what they were. And it, and in sitting down with this, I mean, it was really tuition intensive. I mean, the Yale and US, they had an extraordinary level of kind of engagement with academics and students there. So it was very time consuming. But it did do just as you said. And I mean, I think we've kind of got ourselves in a bit of a mess. Um, we've created these edifices, we call universities, and we've filled them. I mean, everything drives us. I mean, you know, the A-levels here as well, you know, you choose your A-levels and then you go, you end up in a, your, your, your subject area. Of course, there are a few people, there are a few interdisciplinary degrees, you know, PPE and applied, you know, social science, you know, that sort of thing. But generally, you're in a, a disciplinary department. And I mean, the way we get assessed, I mean, just you know, talk about academia for a moment. I mean, the research excellence framework is mainly disciplinary. The government then gives chunks of money to those departments that do best in their disciplines. The kind of QR money comes in. You look at the main journals, they're disciplinary. If you're a communist, you publish in you know, the American Economic Review. If you're a geographer in the Annals of the Association of American Geography, you know, so the whole thing is geared to kind of work against what you're suggesting, but I'm absolutely with you. And in a way, you kind of said, if we were going to start again and design a university from scratch, would it look like this? And I fear it wouldn't. Yeah, it wouldn't look like this, and the courses wouldn't look like this. And probably the teaching wouldn't be like this in a bank lecture theatre, yeah, and, and so on. So, yeah, but how on earth you kind of unpick that? Goodness knows. But, yeah, I mean, and I think some liberal arts colleges in the US try to do that. I mean, and certainly my limited experience with Yale and US, and I was also in Cornell recently, um, I mean, they have some of these kind of interdisciplinary, and I kind of sort of think, yeah, that gets at some of these, the things that I was trying to touch on. We have more events like this. Um, there's a question down here. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm an undergraduate politics student. And I was wondering, uh, within the current international order, how can we hold countries responsible to meet climate targets? <laughs> um, very difficult. Um, I mean, you. Well, as you saw with you know, Donald Trump, you pulled out, um, and you know. So ultimately, yeah, you. I mean, I suppose you do it through cajoling. I mean, the EU is trying to do it. I mean, obviously through setting targets and that sort of thing. Um, and the international order, you've got to get people to buy in. So, of course, which is one of the real challenges that, and in a way, that map I showed. You know, I suppose thinking 
purely kind of rationally, Australia might say, well, actually, it's in our national interest just to carry on as we are. Yeah? Yeah. It's not in our collective global interest, but it may be in the national interest. So you're asking national governments to kind of pay costs which will accrue to the nation that won't accrue to the globe. But yeah? So it's the classic tragedy of the commons. Yeah, that, you know, individually, what makes sense for all of us, I mean, all of us flying, you know, we might say, well, you can stop flying, but I'll carry on, yeah? And I mean, that, of course, then is writ large at the international level. And, and of course, you know, the COP meetings are attempts to just to push it forward. Um, I mean, what's going to happen with COP in Glasgow? Goodness knows. But I mean, you know, the debate is they need to have someone in place, whether it's David Cameron or, I don't know, Tony Blair or Gordon Brown, someone who has sufficient stature to encourage states to do just what you're hinting at. And of course, if you have someone, you know, like us, I mean, it's pointless, yeah, because you just don't have the clout to be able to force through these things. Um, I, I mean, I don't know what um, Boris Johnson, what name he's got up his sleeve, but it needs to be someone who really can, you know, force through those sorts of decisions. Because you are, I mean, you're asking governments and us individually to pay for that, you know, those maps that I put up there. Um, I think it's kind of, it's sort of in two steps forward, one step back sort of thing. You get the sense that, you know, there's a little bit of progress and then you get knocked back and then there's a little bit more progress and knocked back. But of course, time's ticking. We don't have much of it left. Thanks for the question, but there's a question about whether there's a lack of action because of the lack of knowledge, a lack of science, or whether it's due to something else, something more fundamentally political. Yeah, I don't. Um, I mean, I don't think. I, I think we need. We, we, we kind of know what we need to know. I mean, I think the science is is there. I don't. We. I mean, of course, more science is always good. But I mean, I think what's happening. You know, we know it's now a political. It's not a scientific issue any longer. I mean, in terms of what is happening. It's a political question. Um, so, of course, what's going to happen to the Larsen B ice sheet, and you know how fast is it going to happen, and maybe technologies to mitigate and that sort of thing that can happen. But I mean, the core science, I think, I mean, I realise that there are a few people out there who would challenge the science, but I think for 99% of the scientists, it's kind of done and dusted. We can now. Now the question is, what are we going to do about it? I would challenge the science from the other side. Um, forces like our business department has taken over climate and uh, climate scientists are rewarded to fall into line. The uh, IPCC AR5 models haven't even got the um, feedbacks of melting permafrost and uh, forest fires in. and. That, that, that was buried in AR2, the second round of the IPCC. And the fact that nobody knows just how bad it is, with our government saying we're going to be net zero by 2050, and they've got all sorts of, um, what does Greta Thunberg call it, um, accounting tricks to, to hide the facts. Um, it, it's just not not right you know I, I got debt to just before the scientists were uh, sacked or m moved over to bays to admit that they got a lot of missing feedbacks and uh, that they're the ones that are coming out now people are saying oh oh dear there's melting permafrost well they knew that years ago but they they just wouldn't say it and we do need to find a new way to live if We've got 55 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent left for 1.5 degrees. Okay, you make it a bit more, and you might say 1.5 degrees, okay, so we'll be a bit looser. But uh, an SUV gets through 80 tonnes in its 15-year lifetime, then we've got a really big problem that we're not addressing. And it would be great if some human geographers would do some uh, statistics, ACORN, um, mosaic or or p squared which is i know something a little bit about to actually find out which lifestyles are really causing the problem 
In fact, all lifestyles, all our lifestyles are probably causing a problem at the moment, but some are infinitely worse than others. And it would be nice to say, you can't like, live like this anymore. And it would be nice to have a vision of a way of life, like your bridal picture, that was decent and happy and with not many cars. And if you remember Carla Ripa Damiana, the uh, Environment Commissioner in, in the European Commission in the early 90s, he got the sack for commissioning reports saying how much cheaper and nicer it would be to live in, in car-free environments. But the car lobby got him sacked. Mm -hmm. And the last question, do you ever see a role for military force in, in enforcing some of these things? Do we hope for a really tough American president that cares about it and says, we're going to bomb you if you don't, if you don't obey? Boy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose I, yeah. Mm. One can imagine circumstances in which the effects of climate change in terms of famine, migration streams, that sort of thing might require yeah, some sort of you know, intervention. So I mean, I, I can imagine, I'm not saying it's good or anything, but I, I can imagine circumstances like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I mean, in a way, you know, thinking of um, coronavirus, I see there are a lot of signs on coronavirus. Wasn't one of the cases here, just around the corner. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, there they've just in, you know they've made it. What's the term? A national emergency, which means that they could force people to stay in quarantine. So you know, they, people don't have freedom of movement. Or that individual, whoever it was, who said, "I'm fed up. I want to go home." No, you can't. Would a cost-benefit analysis show it's a good idea? What for him not for to go home? Virus. Oh, I see. Can we save on the environment? Maybe, 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 the, the faces in, in positions of power. And we forget the fact that these people were voted in by regular citizens. And a lot of these regular citizens um, might question the validity of climate change. And perhaps rather than focusing so much against these agents of power, turn our attention to, to people and instead of marginalizing them, sort of including them in the conversation mm -hmm. by not infantilizing them and patronizing them. Um, and I'm not necessarily talking about the farmers in Malaysia or, you know, I'm talking about regular citizens in the UK, regular citizens in the US who are driven by the fact that they're ignored, they're not listened. Mm -hmm. and perhaps by making academia not in terms of them becoming academics but instead of making science more interesting and more approachable for people perhaps that could be a better agent of change rather than a hysteria around climate change and making a holy cow out of a 16 year old girl yeah sorry yeah no, I'd, um, I, mean, I, I suppose the I mean, I didn't quite take it that far, but I mean, I suppose the kind of the participatory element in broader terms is that, you know, although Chakrabarty says there are no lifeboats, I mean, and there are, but we are kind of all part of this. It's not something that's happening out there. I mean, it will affect all. And of course, the intergenerational issue, you know, I mean, you know, my children and, you know, your children and all the rest of it, they're the ones who are going to suffer. I mean, in a sense, I'll be fine. I'll be dead. So there's that sort of temporal, that intergenerational justice. So it's not just justice right now. It's, of course, justice in the future. Um, and so we're all part of that. So we're all, in a sense, have, you know, the rights to voice our concerns. Um, and, I mean, you put it very nicely. You know, not infantilize people, not treat them just as objects, like 
sort of pawns on a macroeconomic chessboard that can just be pushed around, to actually say, no, no, okay, you, you're part of this. Um, and uh, I mean, there are attempts to do that. And I mean, I think there are local movements that are trying to include people more fully in it. Um, I mean, of course, when you look at COP and that sort of thing, I mean, and those enormous rooms where everyone gets three minutes and that sort of thing. I mean, that, that's sort of a million miles away from how most of us experience these things. Um, so yeah, I'm, I mean, you put it very nicely. Um, yeah, hi. Um, hi. Just to add on that, um, for my dissertation, so I do English literature and politics, mm -hmm. and I'm like combining green politics with eco-poetry, and eco-poetry is like, uh, it's like, a step uh, further from like nature romantic poetry and it's kind of like a form of activism it's like experimental and it I think it kind of does speak to quite a lot of the green political issues um, that you like mentioned um, so do you think there is a place for uh, literature and poetry as a form of activism from the individual level as opposed to the global level do you think it should we should maybe look to literature to f resonate with the people so that we can, um, so it can be kind of like a philosophical, uh, yeah. yeah. Do you think that's so? Yes, I mean, it, you're kind of moving it beyond the sort of things that I generally think about, but yeah, I mean, that, I suppose that's, I suppose what kind of sits behind the presentation, or at least the first part, the kind of disciplinary reductionism. So it, it's partly the way that, you know, all these subject areas that we kind of talked about, and you know, 98% of work on climate change is conducted in a very small set. And then there are a few people, like Richard and myself, who are kind of on the margins. And then people in literature, of course, are yet more marginalized. But it's all part, part of it. And you know, when you begin to see historians, and then I quoted Chakrabarti, you know, when he's beginning to engage with these things, you think, yeah, and I mean, anthropologists as well, I mean, some really interesting work coming out of anthropology, and I'm sure in literature, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know the poetry you talk about, but absolutely, and it kind of comes back to the question here, but how do you make this meaningful? How do you get people enthused and engaged with it? It's not through probably modeling things, with one or two exceptions, but it's probably through things like art and poetry and that sort of thing. You know? And then people begin to sort of buy in in a more substantive and significant way. And that will be part of, well, if you like, kind of democratizing it all. You know? um, I mean, among climate scientists, I, I mean, a lot of my colleagues are fantastic climate scientists. I don't want you to go away thinking that sort of horned monsters out there. I mean, they're doing wonderfully important work. So I'm, yeah, and that of course needs to carry on. I'm kind of saying that we need to just push the boundaries out. And I don't think there's any, you know, we might as well push it as far as we c it can go, you know, to your area of interest. So it does sound like there's a good conversation being had between the modelers, the poets, political scientists, and uh, archaeologists, archaeologists and others. Yeah. That we will encourage here. I, I just wanted to make a comment and um, building on what someone said about um, you know the need for more interdisciplinarity and in, in, in the need for universities to be organized differently and um, I mean my understanding is that there are some of the universities that were set up in the 60s like Sussex and Essex for example were set up in a much more interdisciplinary model and gradually over the years they've sort of come into line with a more conventional form so I wonder whether you know, one research project is to actually go and look at these experiments in interdisciplinarity from, you know, from decades ago and find out, you know, what, from the people who experienced them, um, you know, like you'd interview farmers, <laughs> you know, find out from the people who were involved in those experiments what it was like, what they learned, what went right, what went wrong, because maybe we can learn from that when we're trying to do it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Absolutely. I mean, I hadn't thought about that, but yes, I mean, and there have been experiments, and I, um, and, you know, and there are degrees that are set up with a particular kind of interdisciplinary, I mean, we were talking about some over, you know, earlier in the day, about trying to bring different subject areas together and, you know, having degrees which cross boundaries. 
I, I suppose the, I mean, my experience of interdisciplinarity, and I try to kind of get that across, it is really, really difficult, yeah? yeah. And um, I've been on, I think, four large interdisciplinary projects. And I know this has been li live streamed, but to be honest, none of them have been interdisciplinary. Everyone has hunkered down in their own safety kind of disciplinary corner. They've tended to publish things in their own disciplinary journals. And so I think there is a real mismatch or a kind of gap between what we claim we want to do and what we actually do. And you have to really work at it, which was that kind of deep and shallow interdisciplinarity thing. Yeah. Deep interdisciplinarity, boy, it's difficult. I mean, I was on a project where we were looking at earthquakes in Nepal, and we had historian and applied social scientist and human geographer, um, three or four earth scientists, a physical, you know, and I can tell you, I mean, when we got together, we, I mean, quite literally talking different languages, yeah? yeah. People would use terms, and someone would say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And you have to go right back to basics. You have to start by saying, we've got a common language. How, how do we speak about these things? And because we, you know, academics more than anyone, we, we just retreat into our own specialist kind of lexicon of terms, um, and we lose each other. So, yeah. I, um, I mean, to do what you suggest would be an interesting exercise. And of course, some schools try, you know, there are specialist schools that try and do these things, try to break down these barriers and borders. <coughs> I'm not, but of course, generally, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when people claim it happens, I'm kind of rather skeptical. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Hello, um, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in an interdisciplinary group at the moment, which is between scientists at British Antarctic Survey, programmers mm. and artists at Central St. Martins in London. Cool. And as you said, there is issues with that, with communication and also different things that the different groups want as outputs. So in terms of the scientists, they want their science communicated. The artists want to interpret the science in a different way and then we're all talking in different languages so we all talk about models I'm a digital modeler in terms of the arts and then we'll have models in terms of programming and also climate models from the scientists so from a live perspective although it it's early stages for us there is difficulties that take a long time to overcome for communication can go forward so yeah. Just, yeah no that's really interesting because I mean I Again, I mean, it's nice to hear it, so to speak, from a horse's mouth. Don't take that personally, but you know what I mean. That someone who's really trying to struggle with these things, so it kind of comes back. It is really, I mean, it sounds, you know, people say, oh, he's saying it's difficult, it's not difficult. It is, isn't it? I mean, really at a very basic level. And you, you almost have to put down ground rules, you know, for respect and for not, you know, demeaning people's work, you know, and, you know, when people scoff, you know, I can just imagine, <laughs> what do you think you're doing? You know, and that sort of thing. So that that you know, and it has to be done from day one because I found that things get embedded, and hierarchies emerge, and people don't take each other seriously, and it can break down very quickly, and then of course it becomes personalised and all the rest of it. So you say the project's just begun, yeah? So whoever's the PI on it, the principal investigator, making you know, really being strict about right, this is how we're going to ensure that voices are heard, that there's participation that everyone's valued equally, blah, blah, is really important. Um, but it sounds as though some of those struggles are already manifesting. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Really interesting. I, I think just because of time we have to wrap up, but uh, I also want to sort of position what we're doing here mm -hmm. as part of this story, because the, the point of having these public lectures and inviting uh, you to, to troublemakers of all persuasions to come here and to have this kind of debate. This is you know, it's really important for us, for academics, for universities, to open up, to be more self-reflexive, uh, to be more critical about what we do and what kind of impact it has, and so that it is a bit more meaningful and that it is you know, uh, an opportunity to influence change. So uh, I just, before I thank Jonathan, I just wanted to point out that we this is one of a series of public lectures um, over this next year, particularly with COP coming up in Glasgow.
who can be exploring these kinds of issues from slightly different perspectives. Uh, on Thursday evening, this Thursday, we have Anne Pettifer, who's an economist who wrote the Green New Deal. She's talking about how, how we implement, how we finance the Green New Deal. So please, if, uh, if you have an interest in these issues, please come along. But for now, I'd really like to thank Jonathan for coming, uh, coming up today and for stimulating this kind of uh, very uh, engaged kind of debate that we've had this evening. Because it's been captured, if you want to look on it, uh, look, uh, look at it, look at the video online, you'll be able to do so. Um, so, thank you. Thanks very much, Thank Jonathan. you. Thank you. So, sorry, just before you go, can I ask uh, how many people have been impacted by the floods recently? Not, not this one, but the previous one. Right. Oh. I was, yeah. I was interested to hear about who's got a voice and you keep doing your yeah. Because I was leaning out of my window with a flood below and it was lovely and fresh air, no cars going by, just, just emerging there. And the Guardian interviewed me out of the window. And when I said it's not helpful, it's, you know, 